Hello and welcome to my 2014 year in review discussion video. It's going to be a very unedited, unscripted video. I'm just going to talk. It's going to be a podcast type thing. The actual video is probably just going to have an image of the game's cover or something in the description. There will be a link to each of the timestamps for all 23 games. I'm going to be talking about 23 games I played in 2014. All right in a row. It's probably going to be like a really long video podcasty type thing for you to listen to while you're doing something else. Uh, these aren't in a particular order of what I enjoyed. The only thing is at the very end, after talking about all 23, I reveal which of the 23 games is my personal favorite, my game of the year. So let's get right on started. I'm also going to be talking about the games sort of in blocks, sort of sets of what genre they are a part of. So first we're going on to roguelikes I played this year. So first of all, Ziggurat. Ziggurat is a first-person shooter roguelike hybrid. It is interesting. I, I did enjoy it. it. It's got a magic theme, so you're a wizard, you have a wand, you get spell books, you get staves, and a uh, sort of weapon like alchemy. There's four categories. So you start out with a wand that has infinite ammo, then you can get three things that consume amp mana, which is the ammo. You fight a bunch of enemies, and you fight bosses, and you go through five different floors. Uh, I do enjoy the game. The thing I dislike about it the most is it doesn't have a great sense of accomplishment, because there is like easy, medium, and hard, and very quickly I was able to beat it on easy. And since the unlock system is a little kind is a little... I don't know, it feels a little off. Because you will not characters sort of over time by just doing things you'll do anyway. Just sort of accumulative things. With items like weapons or perks, because the game has a level up. So you level up every once in a while, you get a new perk. The perks are very well designed, they're interesting. You get a new perk, but it's just randomized. You can't like say, I want to try to get that perk, or I want to try to get this. And it makes playing the game over and over feel a little repetitive when you could beat the game on easy. And sort of see all the enemies and rooms and everything. Because there aren't very many enemies or rooms to keep variety super spicy for very long. But it is still a fun game. I do recommend it to fans of the genre. Next we're going on to uh, Rebirth, Binding of Isaac Rebirth. A fantastic roguelike that sort of does everything Ziggurat did wrong. Where it doesn't feel fun to play it over and over. You know, Ziggurat had the problem where once you beat the final boss you kind of saw most of the game. Isaac very cleverly gets around that issue. Even if you get lucky the very first time and beat Mom, then you have to go and beat Mom's heart. Then you have to beat Mom's heart like 20 fucking times, which is kind of weird, but also kind of dumb. Then you have to kill Satan, and yourself. And then you have to kill Super Satan, and Super Jesus, or whatever. I don't remember, I don't know the final bosses, I never got that far. I really enjoyed Binding of Isaac Rebirth, though. It is, you know, if you enjoyed the original, you'll definitely enjoy Rebirth. Rebirth is definitely better, I think. There's a few things in this game that are kind of bullshit. Overall, much better game, though. Uh, next on the roguelike list is Magicite, a 2D platformer roguelike, which has crafting elements. It's very fun. I certainly enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it's very fun to play. It's a bit confusing at first and certainly cryptic at times. And the controls can be a bit finicky. But it is fun to play. It, it actually kept me playing a bit more, quite a bit longer than Ziggurat did even though I'd still say Ziggurat is the stronger game. Uh, its presentation is nice. It's a simple and fun 2D roguelike. Uh, it has a multiplayer component, which I'm assuming is pretty fun. I couldn't convince anybody to play it with me, but it's a really fun game. And next, we're moving on to the platformers. Uh, i got five platformers to talk about. First is Kirby Triple Deluxe. It's a Kirby game. Uh, in my mind, Superstar Ultra is going to be the best probably forever. And this game is surprisingly fun. I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much. I kind of got it when it was cheaper. And I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I thought I was going to enjoy the spin-off games, the Rhythm DDD game and the Fighters game. I thought I was going to enjoy that more than the main game, but it actually ended up being completely opposite. I hated those two separate modes and adored the main game as well as the Arena and True Arena, which I didn't even know were going to be there. But I loved that in Ultra as a kid. And Kirby Triple Deluxe certainly does deliver. The Hypernova is a little bit questionable, because it just sort of stays on you forever once you get it, so it's sort of like a puzzle, so it sort of feels weird to have like the ultimate power, and then you're just like 
well, the levels are designed in a way that it works, but it feels kind of weird that it's like the ultimate power-up, and it just stays on you for, like, hours if you don't move. It's a little weird, but it's still used well. It's a good game. Especially now that it's cheaper, very solid game to buy. Next we have Shovel Knight, a game so many people are raving about, and for good reason. It's a phenomenal 2D platformer. And I don't have any nostalgia for those old games. I, I never played Mega Man. Fuck that shit. I play Shovel Knight. It's a very fun game. Uh, if I had to make complaints, I'd say that I was very disappointed with New Game Plus. Instead of New Game Plus made the game harder, when I think New Game Plus is more of a way for... It's not a complaint, it's more of my expectations were different. And I was disappointed because of them. Because when I thought New Game Plus, I thought... Oh, it'll be like a similar difficulty, but a bit more difficult, but everything will just sort of be ramped up. I thought, oh, there'll be new upgrades for each of my new items. There'll be new upgrades to get. There'll be new things, but there really isn't. It just makes, it just takes away checkpoints. Taking away checkpoints is the biggest problem for me. That was the thing that really made New Game Plus less interesting for me. Also, when I bought the game, and this is me not doing my research, I suppose, I was sort of expecting it to have everything on the Kickstarter page that it promised already there, but it didn't. It's going to be in free updates, so I shouldn't really complain. It was just something that annoyed me, because I thought I was going to be able to invite my friends over and play it multiplayer, and I couldn't find that feature anywhere, because it's not in the game yet. And it was kind of annoying. It was actually kind of difficult to even find on the internet. I had to sort of dig for it, and even then, all I found was kind of vague. But those are blemishes on an otherwise very, very good game. Very fun 2D platformer. Much recommended. I believe it's coming to other platforms soon, so pick it up. Uh, next is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. A uh, very fun 2D platformer. Uh, very challenging. Not the greatest co-op game, unless you're playing with somebody else like the whole way through. It's got good bosses. It's got pretty good checkpoint layout, as well as good level design. Very excellent soundtrack and presentation in general. It's a very fun game. I do have to say that it, it, it didn't... The Water World, that's what it was. The Water World was absolutely satanic, and I hated it. The water control in that game is just not good. The way, it, The reason it's not good is because... They have so many segments where you have to go fast in the water, or you slow, or whatever, and you have to dodge obstacles, but Donkey Kong doesn't actually move in the water one-to-one. -one. Like, if you turn 180, he does a fucking... Like, he moves around in a way that moves your hitbox in a giant arc that you don't want it to. You want to turn right away, 180, but instead he, like, does a freaking circle, and then at the end of the half circle he's like, oh, I'm gonna go that way now. But then he ends up getting hit because you got too close, and eh. That's my biggest problem with that game, is the water levels where you had to swim were really annoying and frustrating for me. I hated them. I'm sure some people were like, oh yeah, water levels, and I was like, fuck water levels. Like, there's games that have done it right, but this game, no, didn't do it right. But a very fun game. Very, very fun game. I enjoyed it immensely. Next is uh, Little Big Planet 3. I didn't even finish this game, but I put it on the list mainly to talk about it. From a standpoint of, I was honestly kind of disappointed. Honestly, I love Little Big Planet to death, and the main storyline of the game, for me, has always been what's kind of said. Here's what we were able to do. Why don't you try something? And this game, this game is a bit ambitious. It's not made by Media Molecule. It's made by this other company. That if you Google them, right when I saw the trailer, I was like, Oh my God, Little Big Planet three. Then I saw it was a Media Molecule, and I was like, I gotta Google, what have these people have done? And they've done, like, a million shitty racing games, and a million, like, tie-ins, and I was like, ugh, I'm a bit sketch sketchy, a bit skeptical of this. It turned out to be a bit over-ambitious, honestly, which is disappointing. Because it, it really, it really didn't need to be ambitious to be a fun game. They did, it, it, the, the problem was just, you go into a level in the main story, and it glitches all over the place. Even if the game itself isn't actually the glitchy thing, it's just frustrating, because you want to play the main story. Those are well-designed levels. And the fact that you can't play them in a pleasant way, because they didn't bug test it properly, is retarded. I had a glitch where I was able to skip like three levels, because in the game, there's new characters. It is a 2D platform. It's a 2D platform, if you don't know. I'm sort of speaking from an angry fan standpoint without realizing some people don't know Little Big Planet very well. Little Big Planet is a 2D platformer with an emphasis on creating your own levels from the beginning. It's a very good game, very good series. This isn't a bad game, 
But it's a game that frustrated me. Because it, the main story is riddled with bugs. And the game itself feels very, very unpolished. It feels very rushed out the door. And it feels like they just wanted money. And it didn't feel fun to play. And there's issues with transferring items. It's very awkward. It, eh. I still do recommend it. But beware that it will be a bit buggy. It may not be as satisfying as Little Big Planet 1 or 2. Even though it really should be. Because if they just get, if, if Sony gave them more time to bug test it. And I played it a month after it came out too. And they didn't fix everything still. And, you know, a few months down the line when Sony, maybe when they get enough time to fix the goddamn game, it'll be another great Little Big Planet game. But until then, it was a rushed, rushed mess. A disappointingly rushed mess. Because I love Little Big Planet so much. And uh, moving on from that somewhat somber note into Super Panda Adventures. Another game which I actually did not finish because I set the difficulty to hard and you can't change the difficulty and I got stuck and gave up because I'm a coward and also I think a different game came out, can't remember, or I started playing something else or school got in the way or something. But anyway, Super Panda Adventures is a very fun game. It's a very silly 2D platformer, very sort of cheek tongue-in-cheek humor, I suppose. Is that even a proper term? I don't fucking know. I'm going to Google it. Anyway. Uh, Google. Google.com. Tongue in cheek. Uh, anyway. It's a very fun game. It's a 2D platformer with combat where you hit the button. You can shoot shurikens. You're a super panda ninja thing. And it's. Yeah. It's got a little sense of humor to it. You are a panda. It's a fun game. It's got RPG elements as well. It's got side quests. It's got really fun worlds to exp it's got fun levels to explore it has sort of an open world atmosphere without being frustratingly backtracking heavy uh, and that's a good thing it's a really fun game I didn't finish it uh, another problem I do have with it is that the controls are a bit iffy on keyboard because I don't know why every developer assumes that everyone uses spacebar to jump I use the up key on 2d platforms on keyboard like either W or up arrow and so many games have a problem with that where the way the controls are set up you can't edit the control you can edit the controls but you can't edit it in a way where it's comfortable to play with the up key in this game i had that problem until i got used to it but it was really annoying to play until i did get used to it and it's also annoying i can't change the difficulty because i got stuck on a boss that was practically impossible on the difficulty i was on i got through everything else um with some trial and error with some determination some very difficult bits but i was not able to get past that boss so because i couldn't change the difficulty I kind of gave up on it, unfortunately. That's the way it is. I'll probably get back into it at some point, but I'm probably going to have to replay the game or grind, but you can't really grind that effectively. It's a little weird. It is a fun game, though, and it's only I think it's like only like $3. It's very cheap. It's like $5 at most. It's very fun, though. I do recommend it. So next I'm going to go on to some RPGs that I played. These aren't necessarily... These are like the more classical RPGs. These, are, these aren't... Because there's so many games that are like... This is a 2D platform. It's got RPGs, like Super Panda Adventures. These are more straight-up RPGs. Obviously, some variations. So, first of all, Bravely Default's a phenomenal game. It does have the massive, glaring, holy shit, why'd they do that issue of the 5th and 6th chapter, which they sacrifice gameplay for plot in a way I never thought possible. But it's still a fun game. The job system, it's a classical RPG, like Final Fantasy 1, 2... Uh, three, sort of, four and five, six, except it doesn't have the active time battling on four, five, and six do. It's a phenomenal RPG, though. It has a very interesting customization with the job system. There are so many interesting combinations of jobs. If only the game wasn't 70 hours, I'd probably play it over and over, trying to think of interesting ways to combine and mix and match. The characters are well written. They are sort of, especially in the beginning, the main characters are very one-trick pony-esque. They have, uh, as somebody put it, Awakening Syndrome, which I think is a brilliant term in reference to Fire Emblem Awakening, where there's like 80 characters or something, and they all have like one or two character traits, and that's it. And the writers never bothered to add more. Because there's like 80 of them, and they all have to have conversations that are long and shit, and they gave up. Basically gave up. And I thought that was a good way to put it, even though there's probably a way to put it that's more, like, more people would get <laughs> the reference, but... I thought that was a funny way to put it. 
Uh, but this game also has some of the most satisfying boss battles in a long time, at least for me. Because in the game, there's the way you get jobs is from defeating the people that currently have the jobs. And those people are so interesting. There is... Um, there, there is a job right in the beginning, like the white mage and the monk. They're just like guarding their air airship. You, you kill them, you get their asterisks. There's this black mage, the black mage, like fire, like offensive magic. It's like burning houses and stuff, and you have to go kill him to stop him. I'm trying to think of things in the in the beginning of the game so I can spoil it, but this is a more spoiler escon, so you skip ahead a few seconds. But there's this the salve salve maker actually like a chemical bomb basically chemical bomber is basically his name it, it the, the jobs are also interesting like mechanically because they're basically all different this guy like is it gets really dark actually the story but this guy basically takes a bomb and there's a civil war going on in one of the places this guy takes a bomb and blows up like 10,000 soldiers from both sides and he doesn't even care and it's very dark some of the plot moments are very dark and it's also not blunt the game is not blunt. The game really does... Sometimes it's blunt. Sometimes it's really blunt. Sometimes it's a bit too blunt. But usually it's very clever. Even though it does sacrifice... The plot... The gameplay it sacrifices for the plot probably isn't worth it. They could have made it less gameplay sacrificial. And made it more just like an hour of cutscenes. I would have probably been more okay with than the very repetitive 5th and 6th chapter of the game leading up to the finale, which is phenomenal. The reveals and plot is actually great at the end, but the gameplay sacrificed wasn't really worth it in my opinion. So on to the next game, which is going to be Pokemon Alpha Sapphire. I played Alpha Sapphire, didn't play Omega Ruby. Alpha Sapphire is good though. I mean, I did a Nuzlocke on it, so my opinion might be different. Take that with a grain of salt. I, I won the Nuzlocke. I have not done the Delta episode, which I hear is good. Because I beat the Nuzlocke and I just put my 3DS down like, Yeah, I did it. I'm done with life. And uh, it's a good game. I mean, it certainly does seem like it has things. I'm not... I don't know, I guess I'm just not as excited to get into it again. In X and Y, I spent like 300 hours on the game. Very fast. I like got a competitive team. And I don't know. I don't really want to do that again. It's very time-consuming and somewhat tedious. It does seem fun, though. I'll probably do the Delta episode. Uh, there, it's a legitimate complaint, there is too much water. The fact that every fucking route has got, like, oh, there's a tentacle, there's a whale mark. When you're doing a Nuzlocke, it's especially infuriating, because it's just like, look at all these routes with Pokemon, maybe I could know, they're all the fucking same. It's incredibly frustrating in that respect. You know, I don't care if you're making a remake. You fucking add. You have, like, so many water Pokemon. So many water Pokemon. That's like the most common type, and you can't fucking just put in like a fucking. put in a fucking anything from a different series, a different gen, in some of those water routes. Just some. somewhere. Like one per route, maybe, to make it a little bit more interesting. It would be really nice, Game Freak. You did a lot of good things. The fact that you can fly everywhere, and the fact that you could fly with Latias from anywhere without a flying Pokemon is actually really nice. Uh, it's very cool. It's a good game. It's, you know, it's Pokemon. If you like it, you'll like it. Uh, next is Costume Quest 2, the Halloween-y RPG uh, from Double Fine. It's a very fun game. I do enjoy it. The biggest problem with it, I think, is that, from what I've heard, almost all the versions have a lot of bugs, or had a lot of bugs. I, I got the Wii U version. I was playing it on Halloween. It's a very fun game. I love the original, but... This game has a lot of... Okay, first of all, the Wii U. I think... I've heard that different versions have different bugs. Like, there's different horrible issues with each version. At least at launch. They fixed the Wii U version. At least the horrible bugs. You don't. You can't play off-screen play, which... I, I mean, I guess it's not a big deal. But I think the only controller you could use is the gamepad, so... It ends up being kind of annoying that you have to use the bulkiest controller and it has no functionality. But the biggest problem is that the Wii U version, at least, was horribly optimized to the point where the frame rate was like 15... And it was slow and chunky and laggy as hell. Like, it was hard to time the button presses. I played through so much of the game like that, and then I kind of gave up. And then when I went back and played it for like 10 minutes, I was like, oh, they patched it and fixed it. But I didn't care at that point, so I haven't actually finished the game. I really want to, but... It's like, ah, your game was so fucked up, I... 
Eh. Stopped caring. It is a good game, I do recommend it. From what I heard, like, the PC version apparently has horrible audio glitches everywhere. And I'm pretty sure the PS4 and Vita version was actually released later than the Wii U and PC version, so I didn't want to play that, because I want to play it a little bit of Halloween! Eh, it's annoying. A little frustrating. This year at a lot of games that seem to come out a little broken. Uh, anyway, next, on to a game. Uh, this one is... this one's phenomenal. Hearthstone is just... oh, I love you, baby. You're so great. Gotta, gotta go... gotta go hard. I spent so much money on this game. You know, Christmas comes along and you get some money and then you're like, well, I could save it. There's like a Zelda game coming out next year. I think there's like a new Ratchet and Clank, but it might be a remake, I don't remember. It's like a Ratchet and Clank game. There's Uncharted 4. All these great, excellent titles. Oh, Splatoon. I want to buy Splatoon. Or I could buy Hearthstone cards. <gasps> I got a Legendary! Oh yeah, Hearthstone cards. Hearthstone is so fun. If you haven't played Hearthstone, I highly recommend it. It's a card game. You know, you get one mana each turn, you play your cards, it's so phenomenal. I adore it. Absolutely love it. Play it every day, pretty much. It's so good. It's so good. So good. I mean, you probably already know about it. I feel like it's really it's really popular on Twitch, for streamers. It's such a good game. It's such a good game. If you don't know about it, it's free to play. I highly recommend you try it out. So much fun. And next is another card game, because we are actually talking about card games. I have two card games I played this year. The other is Card City Knights. I played on my phone a bunch at the beginning of the year, so I haven't played it in a long time. I actually got stuck on the final boss, I believe, and I haven't really pulled it out since. But it's a really fun game. It's actually got a great sense of quirky humor. And it's sort of like a card game. It's sort of like a Smash Bros card game. But instead of Smash Bros like fighting, I mean Smash Bros like mixed like matchup mashup series and it's really satisfying it's got this really cool mechanic you basically have like a tic-tac-toe board of three by three and you play cards that interact with cards next to it and if the cards match up i can't remember the exact mechanics now i haven't played it in months but if the cards match up right you attack your opponent for damage so basically if you match three uh, attack cards because e okay each card has arrows on it up down left, right, and diagonally. And since it's a 3x3, three three, if you connect three attack cards with the arrows, you deal damage to your opponent. And based on what the cards say, they do different things. And then you have defense cards to increase your health. And it's so much fun. I recommend it immensely. It is so much fun. It's got a great sense of humor, great cards. There's a lot of really cool card designs. It's a single player game. There's no multiplayer component. So, you know, you have some really OP cards. You know, just be warned, there are some really OP cards. The final boss uses, like, all the cards that are OP. Because there's legendary cards, like, super rare cards. You can only have one in a deck of your cards, and he has, like, every single one in his deck. Which is why I was like, I don't know. That's kind of tricky. Why don't I go play Hearthstone? Sometimes I get opponents on there who go, a go AFK. You know... I really recommend Card City Knights, though. It's like 2 or $3, I think. It's on Steam and Android. Not positive about iOS, but it's so fun. Super phenomenal card game. It's also got a great soundtrack, too. Great soundtrack. And it's talking about the mashup thing. All the cards, most of the cards, are references to other games that developer has made. It's a very small indie developer. I bought a lot of their other games on Android. Eh, they're fun. Their other games aren't nearly as fun as Card City Knights, and I don't recommend them as much on iPhone. Or on Android. They didn't come out this year, though. There's one that's actually a really clever sort of fighting game that's actually really fun, but it's on phone. It's not as fun because it's on phone. I wish it was on PC. I wish there was like a PC mega pack of their games. And there's a lot of like arcadey games on there. They also have a Zelda satire slash parody game where they sort of play at the Zelda series, like top down Zelda series, called Ibn Ah. No, I can't remember the name of it, but it's also on Android and it didn't work for my phone. But it is a fun. It is a fun game from what I got to play before it kind of glitched out. It kind of removed half the graphics, but it's a really cool game. If you're a fan of whatever their game that's a parody of Zelda games, I can't remember what it is called, but it exists. It's a very fun game that mashes up a lot of cards from their other games. Their the company is called Ludiosity, so you can Google it. If maybe maybe you'll play one of their games. Carson United is phenomenal. Next is racing. 
And for racing, we have Mario Kart 8, and that is all. Mario Kart 8 is Mario Kart. There is some carts. Mario rides in carts. So does his friends. Some of them are named Yoshi, or Luigi. Luigi's actually his brother, but they are also friends. Uh, that's really it. And it's Mario Kart. Uh, some people seem to have played it for like hours upon hours. I, I enjoyed it. I did play it. Uh, I thought it was really fun. I bought the DLC. I thought that was pretty fun. It's a good game. The, the most, the best part about it was the fact that I got a gift card from Dell and a free game from Nintendo for it. That was the best part because I got Pikmin 3 from that. Pikmin 3 is really fun. But that didn't come out this year, so we're going to drop that topic. Mario Kart 8, I don't know. I mean, I didn't play 7 on the 3DS. And I haven't played a lot of the Mario Kart games. I've played the Wii one, I think. The DS. Mario Kart DS. Mario Kart Wii. And uh, that's really it. Oh, and I've played a tiny bit of 64. Because it's on the Virtual Console on the Wii. And I got it at one point. But it's not... It's Mario Kart 64. It has not aged well. People will tell you it has. It really has. Uh, the battle mode is probably the, probably the best on that one, but... Because battle mode on Mario Kart 8 is trash, by the way. That is the biggest detriment against the game, is that whole mode is completely shit. Absolutely, absolutely arse. Completely valueless to the package of the game. Uh, the racing, though, is really fun. There's some really cool tracks. I really love the sort of techno hip-hop track that sort of the music plays along with your car driving along it. That one's really fun. Uh, yeah, it's a fun game. You drive, you, you drift, there's parts to get, there's characters to unlock, there's tracks that you race on, and Mario's in it! And also Link now, because you can pay for Link. Also tracks that are way cooler than Link, but, you know, you could play as Link. I, I know that I've seen plenty of pictures of people online with every single person was Link, so, you know, you could play as Mario, but probably Link. And next we're moving on to uh, puzzle games. Puzzle games. Which we're going to be talking about, uh, first of all, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. I never played Super Mario 3D World. I didn't love 3D Land on 3DS. I thought it was a fun game, but it was very forgettable for me. When I see 3D Land for like $30, $40, maybe $20, i will definitely pick it up. Because I definitely had a lot of fun playing 3D Land, but it was very forgettable, and it's not an experience I really want to repeat. On the other hand, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker is an experience that I adored. It was so cute and colorful and fun. Captain Toad and Toadette are absolutely adorable. They have so many little quirks that you can see. For example, I accident I spun the control stick over and over in circles, and Toad will actually fall down. And I believe if you spin it just enough, he'll do like a pirouette in the middle of the floor. If you do it, if you stop right before he falls down, he looks like he does like a pirouette. And it's like, yay, I didn't fall like a dipshit. And it's really fun. There's some really good puzzles. Just getting to the end of the level isn't very difficult for a lot of them. But the uh, extra challenges and getting all the gems is really fun. The level design is really, really clever. The monsters are really personalized. We've got a lot of... It's oozing charm in the best way. It's a very fun game to play. It's got tons of different levels. It's a good game. Highly recommended. Next puzzle game is another Android game, is Threes, which, it's a fun puzzle game. Uh, it's a really fun puzzle game. If you don't know what it is, it's a bit more obscure. It's sort of what 2048 was modeled after, because 2048 came out after Threes, and the reason everyone knows what 2048 is, probably knows what 2048 is, much more popular, because it was free. Threes costed money, and money is hard to come by in this economy, so... Threes, even though it's superior in pretty much every way. It's got better game design, it sounds really nice, it's got a great soundtrack, and it's got really, really charming graphics. 2048, because it was free, it's much more popular. But very similar games in concept still, even though Threes is more methodical. Threes is more methodical in its planning. Basically, Threes is you match a 1 and a 2. At the beginning of every move, basically a 1 or a 2 spawns. You slide a 1 and a 2 together to get a 3. Then you slide two threes to get a 6, two sixes to get a 12, etc, etc, etc. It's very charming. It's very fun to play, and it's a good game. I do recommend it. Uh, one of the favorite, one of my favorite parts about it is that the numbers have like little faces and they have personalities. You can tell that like, one of them has like headphones on and is like jamming out. One of them looks like retarded. 
got like a sort of Eeyore face. It's really charming and fun. It's a great game. Next, I want to talk about uh, Broken Age, the first part. The second part doesn't come, hasn't come out yet. First part was really fun, though. The only disappointing part was that the puzzles were painfully obvious, but it was still very charming. It has really fun writing, and it's very, very satisfying. I didn't see the plot twist coming, but it was very fun to see it. Because everything makes sense. It's very well written. The biggest disappointment is the puzzles, which are just kind of boring. They're sometimes either too obscure to make any sense, or they make too much sense and you're instantly like, well, I know what to do exactly now. And there's no challenge. But it's still very fun. I mean, Jack Black's in it, playing the leader of a cult. So I really can't have too many complaints. Uh, Bella's... And there's Villa and Shane. This is a point-and-click adventure game. I do realize, you know, 32 minutes into this, that I have been very much so talking about these games without actually explaining what they are. Very many times. Probably a bad idea. Unscripted content. Best content. No problems with unscripted content. Anyway, I'm gonna really have to, like, grab some trailer footage of this shit and put it on the video so that people understand what I'm talking about, huh? Anyway, Broken Age Act 1 is fun. Uh, you might want to wait until the second half comes out, it's probably close now. And just buy the whole thing at once, play through the whole thing, because the cliffhanger feels a little bit out of place. It clearly wasn't intended, but it is still satisfying in the end. It's a good point and clicker, even though the puzzles are really simple. And next we have See No Evil. This game is phenomenal. I actually really love See No Evil. See No Evil is an isometric puzzle game that uses sound, and it's so fun. It's it's really super phenomenal. I played it through in one sitting. It's a bit short. The A lot of people say they have different play times based on how puzzle-savvy they are, I suppose. I beat it in like three or four hours in between there, maybe three and a half. Some people say six, so, you know. Uh, it's just so good. I, I want to make a video just totally dedicated to this game and how great it is. It's just so good. I don't even know how to describe it basic premise is it's an isometric puzzle game. Everyone in the world has decided to stop opening their eyes. Everybody, except for you. You've opened your eyes and decided to go out and try to convince everyone to open their eyes, but everyone will kill you unless you use the super magical convinceotron matic thing. You know, there's a, con there's a narrator every once in a while talking to you. She's really weird and creepy. She's the one trying to convince you to come back. And then there's also text on the screen that sort of describes things. And the plot was so intriguing to me. I was kind of annoyed when I got stumped on a puzzle because I, I couldn't figure out what happened next in the plot. In the story. And that's interesting for a puzzle game. It's super satisfying. And the way the sound works, because you're the only one that can see, right? So you can see, and you can see your footsteps. Little, like, sound waves coming out of your feet. And everyone else obviously can't see you. So you can, you can stand right next to your enemies... And as long as they walk by you, you're okay. And it's terrifying the first few times. It's so creepy and weird to just stand next to somebody. And the game plays like a heartbeat sound. So it's like, butchu, butchu, right as the enemy walks by you. And you're just standing still, like speechless, as they just walk right by you and continue on. And then you could like shout so that enemies get distracted or whatever. There's a lot of really cool mechanics. And it's a very fun game. I really recommend it. It's a, it might be a bit expensive for some people. There is a New Game Plus, but I didn't really get too much into it. I got it for a $6, I think, and I am wholesomely satisfied. I, I would have paid 15 honestly. I think the full price is 15 I would have paid 15 It's a very, very, very good game. I really recommend it. It's a phenomenal puzzle game. And next we go on to the sort of multiplayer mayhem, I guess, games. Starting with Towerfall Ascension. Oh my god, Towerfall Ascension is so good. I played a little bit of Towerfall on the Ouya when it very first came out. Uh, the Ouya, by the way, don't buy it. There's very little reason to buy it. But Towerfall was the reason to buy it. And now Towerfall Ascension's out on everything. And by that I mean PS4 and a PC. But the PS4 version is the version I played with my friends, and it is wholesomely the most fun I've had on the PlayStation 4. It is just so good. You can jump and shoot arrows, and it is so much fun. It is ridiculous how much fun Towerfall is. If you don't know what Towerfall is, it's a 2D sort of 
twin sticky shooter. It's, it's weird. Just buy Towerfall. Buy a buy it on your PC and plug in controllers. It can be annoying to do, I know. But do it. Just do it. It is such a phenomenal, phenomenal multiplayer game. The biggest disappointment of the game is probably that you can't play online. Which, obviously, I do I do I do like the encouragement of couch play. Because that is the most fun way to play, but it would still be nice. Even if it was peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm sure somebody will jury rig it, but I'm fine. Towerfall Ascension is amazing in my book. Next is a uh, Lethal League. Another phenomenal multiplayer game. I never got to play it with four people. I only got to play it 1v1 with one of my friends, and I still had a blast. The character designs are great, the specials are super fun, the stages are fun, the soundtrack in that game, Lethal League, is absolutely ridiculously good. I, I love the soundtrack, it is phenomenal, the pixel art is nice, the hype, like really? Hype is kind of a meme at this point, like hype, but this game has the hype, like oozing from the cracks. Like when you hit that ball when it's going like 400 billion miles an hour, and it's like, oh my god, and then your friend hits him, it's like, holy shit! Like, the hype is off the walls. It's also really simple yet complex. I like that. It's a phenomenal game. I so much so recommend it. Lethal League is... it's great. It's absolutely great. Next, the party game. It's Smash 4, guys. Smash 4. I bought Wii U, I bought 3DS, day one for each. I was so excited for Smash 4, and I was horribly disappointed that I'm so bad at it. <laughs> no, it's it's like the best game ever. There's no debate. You can't say that Smash Smash 4 isn't the best game ever made, uh, because Smash 5 hasn't come out yet, so you can't say Smash 4 isn't the best game ever made, because until Smash 5 it is the best game ever made. It's, it's undeniable. There's the science behind this, right? I mean, you have to look at it like... First there was Smash Super, Super Smash Brothers for 64, I haven't played that one very much, I played it for like two hours maybe. That one's the best game ever. Then Melee's the best game ever. Then Brawl's the best game ever. I know people will disagree with me, but I, I, I like Brawl. I like Brawl a lot. I think Brawl's fine. I think Brawl's a completely fine game. I, I don't think you should say Melee is better. I, I can understand, I, I understand if you say Melee is better, but I, I don't dislike Brawl. You should respect that. Smash 4 is my favorite though. I love Smash 4. Smash 4 is the best. Uh, Smash 4 is the best. Ever. Rob's my main. Down here, up here. And the forward smash, I don't know. That's not a real combo, but I'll make it one. Somehow, I don't know. It's so good. It just... It's Smash 4. 8-player smash is welcome. You know, when you get 5 people, 6 people, it's tons of fun. It is... It's the best Smash game yet, in my opinion. I've had so much fun playing it. It is super satisfying to play. My biggest disappointment, my big, biggest gripe with the game is that the game doesn't teach you everything. I wish there was like some really weirdly in-depth tutorials for the series in this game. I, I don't know why. And I think the other problem, first of all, okay, I did. I haven't talked about individual version differences. I do think the Wii U version is superior. I definitely don't think the 3DS version should be overshadowed, though. I do like classic mode better on 3DS than Wii U. They're very similar. And they're practically the same, but if I had to pick. Also, uh, the Wii U version does have events, which are very fun. However, they also have the problem of a nasty habit of setting you as one person against two other characters, which is just bullshit. Like, that's just bullshit. And they do it so many more times than they need to that it's kind of annoying and frustrating. The co-op events are fun, though. Playing classical Smash is great. Smash Tour is shit, though. So is Smash Run, though. I don't. I didn't really like Smash Run either. Smash Run was more fun than Smash Tour. Smash Tour I played just to get the Pac-Man stage, even though that sucked anyway, so I guess they should just put the shittiest stage in the uh, shittiest mode. Ha ha ha. But it is such a phenomenal game. The character design is great. I love all the characters. I even like Dark Pit. I'm fine with it. When I was like a kid, I was like, why is we playing Melee Super Bro? Why is there seven clones in this game? That's dumb. And in Brawl, I was the same way, but I'm okay with it now. I'm a little bit more okay with it. There's like five or six clones in this game, and there's three like straight-up clones, and there's like two or three sort of a little bit more debatable, even though they're basically clones. I'm okay with it. I'm not too upset. I do hope they add more DLC. I mean, it seems a little weird that they would say they won't add more DLC. 
especially considering the demand for the product. It seems like there's overwhelming demand for the product of Smash Brothers DLC. I can understand if maybe they're thinking to themselves, we take three months to make this thing. This thing people are wanting, we, we take three months to make it. How much money will we actually make? How much can we get away selling it for? I could see if there's actually business reasons for it. But, you know, if it doesn't cost them five billion dollars to make, you know, Mew as a playable character, because they're already making Mew too. You know, let's say they make Mew, just because I couldn't think of anything intelligent to say. If they put that in, does it cost them five billion dollars to make, or does it cost them, like, a hundred thousand, and then they'll make sales? I don't know. But also keep more people playing the game for longer, which is probably a good thing. So I don't really know. But it is Smash Brothers, and it is the best one yet, in my opinion. Character designs are seriously phenomenal, you know. You got Robin, you could, you know, it's in a book, you could, like, toss your book, like, backhand your book up, pick it up, and then slap it into somebody, and it's like, Poof! it's like I have a book. Reading Rainbow, like, that's great. You've got, like, a Rosalina and a Luma, and they're, like, Ice Climbers, sort of, kind of, and not really. People are mad about Ice Climbers. I'm not too upset. I, I, I never played as Ice Climbers, and none of my friends did, so I don't really know what I'm missing. But, I think they could have pulled off Ice Climbers, but I think they would have done it if they had to. I feel like they had to have done it in a way where people would be confused. Where they would have been, the reason they didn't do it would be like, oh, the casuals won't understand. Because I feel like if they were to do Ice Climbers, they would say like, we've changed the frame rate now because the Ice Climbers are there. And then people get upset and competitive because the frame rate's different. And then people, casuals, wouldn't really know. But they'd be like, why does the Ice Climbers look so she? So I don't know. Ice Climbers. I think they, think they, I think they could have done it. If I'm honest, I think they could have also just made Ice Climber. Sure, it's completely against the character's sort of persona, but at least they're there, sort of. But then again, I'm not going to hearken on what is pretty much a perfect character roster. By far the best in the series, in my opinion. Absolutely the best in the series, in my opinion. Absolutely the best in the series. So next, on to Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy, Curtain Call. I played the original Theater Rhythm, I enjoyed it. I played the second one, I enjoyed it. They're very similar games. This one adds a battle mode. And this is a rhythm game. I just realized I haven't really been explaining things, like I said, but... Eh, you'll figure it out. If you don't know what a game is, Google it. That's the best I can tell you. So anyway, Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy Curtain Call is just a game where you curl all your curtains. That was... that wasn't, a, that wasn't even considered a joke in, like, a club of retards that don't understand what jokes are. That, that's terrible. I'm sorry. Here the Final Fantasy Curtain Call is a rhythm game that uses Final Fantasy music. You slide or you use the buttons. You can use buttons in this one, which is a nice addition, because the touchscreen for me in the first one was always really finicky. Like, I, I liked using it, but it was glitchy. Like, it, sometimes when I was holding down on a long note, it would just say that I let go and I didn't. And I was really annoyed, because it was like, I'm trying to get it perfect. Oh, it just decided I lost. And that was really annoying, so I'm glad the buttons are there. Because the stylus was just unresponsive enough to be really frustrating. It is, however, sort of to the detriment of the game. Because it's kind of... The game is very similar to the first. If you enjoyed the first, you'll enjoy the second. But if you thought the first was like, that's a good game. And you played it for like 50 hours, then you play the second. And you're like, well, this is the same game. It's kind of up to your personal likings. Like, do you like playing the same game twice? Because it's kind of the same game twice. It's got new songs, it's got a few new modes that are much better. The tower thing in the original was dumb. This one's got a much better mode that serves a similar purpose, and it's also got the battle mode, which is really fun, even though I could not find a single human opponent. It was still very fun. And that's all I really have to say about that. And lastly is a somewhat obscure 3DS title, Rusty's Real Deal Baseball. This one I'm going to explain because I feel like nobody knows what this game is, but I think it's awesome. It is a free-to-play game that truly understands what free-to-play means in the best of ways. It is not like, oh, you can spend $5 to get a new cosmetic. No, it is you can spend $5 to unlock a part of the game. But it's like, it's just, it's a baseball kind of game. It's a, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a really clever satire, sort of, in a way, of like the way, just, the, it's really funny. The story is solid. It's basically a minigame collection, baseball themed, and it's so much fun. It's just so much fun. You you can actually haggle 
because the point is that Rusty is a washed up old baseball baseball guy. He used to play on the sports teams, he used to play in the big leagues, and he's washed up and now he runs a baseball shop. But none of the kids want to buy baseballs anymore because they want to buy video games, so he starts stocking baseball video games. And you can buy them to play on your Nintendo 4DS. Which is, first of all, kind of funny that they're satiring himself, because this is actually a Nintendo product, Nintendo game. And you can actually haggle with Rusty and convince him to lower the price of his games, which are real money. All the little mini-games that he sells are real money. They start off at $4, and you could haggle with him, usually to get them to around $2. Usually. Uh, sometimes You can't go lower than, like, $1.50, I think. But you can usually haggle with them. They're sort of like puzzles, like inventory puzzles that are really fun. And they're super satisfying because you're saving real money. If you buy them all at full, if you buy all the mini games at full price, you're spending forty dollars, which is a normal 3DS game. And if you buy them all at like half, you get twenty dollars, which is much less than a normal 3DS game. It feels fun. There's no other monetization. It's just buy the games, buy the mini games. There's fifty levels per mini game, I believe, and they're quite varied. Uh, they're quite varied, surprisingly quite varied, and very fun. Very fun levels. Some very fun mini games. And the story, the game actually is a surprising story. It's talking about Rusty getting like divorced from his wife. It's a humorous story. He, uh, where he like crashed, where like his little kid, he's a ton of little, because he's a dog. I suppose that's kind of important. But he has all his little puppies, little pups, all with him, and they get into weird situations and stuff. And I mean, he did divorce his wife. I mean, that's surprisingly dark, actually, now that I think about it, but they don't talk about that. It's a really fun game, though. I do recommend it. It's a really fun free-to-play game. That really shows what free-to-play as a medium can do, besides monetizing hats. You know, $10 for this a hat, or $4 for this section of a game that you can play. It feels satisfying, because you actually lowered the price yourself for solving puzzles. Really fun. And uh, that's all 23 games. That's 48 minutes of fun, according to my, my count. Probably going to edit some of this out. <laughs> like that sniffle. Now I'm not going to edit out the sniffle, though, because I said that. That sounds weird. Anyway, now we're going to go on to, out of those 23 games, you can take a guess. There's 23 of them, so quite a bit of information, but my game of the year, you can guess it, uh, based on what I've said about all these games, I'm, I'm curious to think what audiences around the world by that I mean five viewers. Well, Think is my game of the year. And it's Bravely Default. Uh, I, I suppose I kind of overhit it by being like, oh, there's a major problem with this game. Also, Smash is the best game ever. Smash is the best game ever, but Bravely Default is special. It's got a glaring issue being chapters five and six being retarded. But it's otherwise completely perfect in my eyes, except for the, the finale is a little bit imperfect. There's a small issue I have with the enemy design in that final dungeon that uses a lot of palette swaps. But that's okay. I'll let it slide. Because it's so goddamn good. I played this game for like eight hours straight the first day I got it. And I was having constant amounts of fun. Until five and six. Five and six is where I kind of stopped playing for like months. And then I got back into it. I finished it. I watched the Bravely Second trailer, and honestly, whenever Bravely Second comes out, that's probably going to be my game of the year that year. I, I can't wait. It, it was such a phenomenal end. You know, it was it was a little bit worth it, honestly. They sacrificed gameplay for the plot, and the plot was actually almost good enough to justify it. Not good enough, though. That was bullshit. But it was almost good enough to justify it. The job system was so robust and phenomenal, I adored it. You know, you could make so many mix and matches. The multiplayer online sort of pseudo co-op was also really interesting. I didn't really have anybody to use it with during my main playthrough, but it was still super interesting. The special moves were awesome. The soundtrack, I didn't even get to that, is so good. The visuals, just in general, the presentation overall is great. It's a phenomenal game. I... Absolutely! That was a weird thing I... Okay. Absolutely recommend it. It is so good. I love this game. Absolutely adore it. And well, that's my uh, year in review 2014. It also will uh, show unscripted versus scripted content. Because unscripted content and very minimally edited content is 
always good and never has faults. Except for all the faults that it has, which is pretty much pretty much just the fact that it's unedited and unscripted and exists. I hope you enjoyed it. This is a podcast type thing, once again. I said that I was going to edit in clips of the games, but that's a lot of work. Boy, I sound like a lazy prick. I gotta go work on my actual video that's gonna be, like, good. Instead of being, like, just talking about video games. I suppose that's what actual videos are, but they're scripted. I mean, they have, like, introductions. Oh, so complicated making a real video. Real videos have, like, an intro. This video is not gonna have that. Yes, it will. Eh, fuck it. See you all next time. Have a good whatever the fuck it is. Day, night. Hanukkah. Have a good one of them. Have fun playing games, and I'll see you next time.